Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to this session. Uh, yeah, we'll just start slightly early. The, there's going to be an introduction, so that's going to take a bit of time. Uh, but yeah, my name is Khalil Spock, and this is going to be just application performance and some useful tools and practices I've used on some projects in the past. So, some things about me. Currently, I'm a tech lead of Wayfair, started working all the way back in 2014 and, you know, almost 10 years of experience working with progress at this point. Uh, in the meantime, worked on several different projects. So all the way in 2014, if, you know, you click the info button on your TV and you got an error message, that was progress error message. Might have been me, might not have been, but, you know. And then, yeah, various other things. So inventory management and right now some e-commerce-ish platform. Uh, for all of those projects, performance always came up as an issue, not necessarily quite as important or not quite as early, but, you know, it, it just has a way of popping up occasionally. The, the biggest issue so far is that performance work wasn't really done proactively. So you start work on a project, you did all of your changes, all of your new features, and towards the end, you're going to start noticing that you know, performance isn't quite where it should be, but at that point, it's kind of hard to do. So, yeah, if it's done proactively, it's just going to be a lot easier for everyone involved. So, some quick things about Wayfair. I'm not going to read all of this, but we've got a lot of experience, 10 plus years. We've got experience in consultancy, application development, application maintenance and support. We've got experience in a lot of uh, progress products, um, web technologies, cloud, and all of that. So if anyone's interested, we've got a boot, yeah, towards the right and all the way at the back. But now to the actual contents of the talk. So we've got, first off, how you identify performance issues, the, the bad way, essentially when they pop up in your face and you have to deal with them. Uh, some case study details. So all of this is for a project I'm working on and it's essentially the way we dealt with performance issues as they came up. Then, yeah, the process we went through, the tools used, and finally some miscellaneous findings, not necessarily performance related, but they were interesting at the time. So yeah, here they are. Now, some other sessions, kind of on the performance track, there's a bunch of them, so if anyone's interested, please take a look. There was a pretty interesting one earlier today about Sonar, uh, Sonar Cube and Sonar Lint and using rules in that to, you know, help with performance. In that case, the example was a table that was just using the wrong indexes occasionally. So, yeah, a, a lot of interesting talk this week. Now... The first way you're going to identify performance issues is that things are going to start being slow. And slow in the sense that something that's not supposed to be slow. So building up a piece of UI, clicking on a button and then having to wait 10 seconds. Things that are noticeably slow and they shouldn't be. That's the way you identify them. But it's, it's one of those things where slow needs to be defined and not everyone's going to have the same definition. So it's going to start becoming more and more of an issue. Next, you've got things becoming noticeably slower after a change. So if something goes from two seconds to five seconds, people are going to start noticing this quite quickly. But again, someone's going to have to notice it. And depending on how bad the performance issue is, it's going to be hard to do just by, you know, relying on people. Next off, things that are subjectively perceived to be slow. So this isn't really a performance issue, and it just refers to parts of a process that take a long while. So if you have to run a report that looks at 10 years of historical data, it's you know, going to take a while. If you have to communicate with 10 different APIs, that might take a while as well. So it's these kinds of bits and pieces that people are going to feel are slow. And it's more of a UX issue at the end of the day, not really something strictly performance related. Then the final fun one is when a customer calls you at 3 a.m., that's not the ideal way to find out about performance issues and someone's going to wake you up at 3 a.m. as a developer anyway because someone's going to have to deal with it. Now, some of the caveats for all of those ways of finding performance issues. So for slow actions, you've got to define slow. 
if you're getting close to you know the end of the sprint, slow is going to start becoming a bit more nebulous, and you know one second extra or few or less is is going to be okay-ish. Then you might fix the issue imperfectly. So you've gone through a feature, everything works, it's just slow, and you have to deal with that. You're going to start making a fix, and at some point, performance is going to go from being slow to being okay. Now, the problem here is whatever you fixed, well, good, it wasn't necessarily the best way of dealing with the issue. So now you have essentially half of the performance issue you started with, which isn't ideal. Then you're going to leave taking time bombs behind. Now, you're developing a feature, and in your development environment, you're not going to have an issue. But 10 years down the line, when you know the size of the table just balloons up and up, whatever query you're using might just start getting slower and slower. Or you, know, you might make some decisions that go badly as the number of users increase. So if you have to do a bunch of disk I.O. for whatever reason, because you want to write something to a file, that's never going to scale up properly. Now, noticeably slower after a change or a release. Someone has to notice it. So if it's a big change, people will notice it. They won't necessarily care about it because, you know, it might not be that big of an increase, but it's, it's still noticeable. The problem is noticeable depends on a lot of things. So if you're using a web app and your network is slow anyway, for whatever reason, if the request time just goes up by one second, you might just chalk it up to, okay, Wi-Fi is just bad today. And, you know, even if things aren't bad today, the performance issue might just be a 3% loss because something you're doing badly. That's never going to get noticed. And over time, it's going to keep adding up because, you know, a query here, a query there, maybe a pause statement just to deal with some one-off issue. It's fine for a little bit, but as you go to releases, those are just going to add up and make your whole application really unusable. Finally, they're going to end up being a low priority issue. So in this case, you know, you've gone through a release, something's kind of bad. Whoever looks at it is going to go, you know, okay, we have this performance issue, but it's not a big priority. The application still works. It's not completely unusable. It's not so bad that customers complain about it constantly. So we'll create an issue for it and just, you know, leave it there until we have time for it. And you're going to go with a couple of releases where you keep creating these and they're you know, going to add up, but nothing's really going to happen about them. Then subjectively perceived to be slow, usually not a performance issue, and it might be potentially easy to fix. So if you've already got some processes that get offloaded because they take a long time, or you've got some mechanism through which you just you know, split up whatever needs to happen into a bunch of different requests that might make it really easy to deal with issues like this because that report, you don't necessarily have to wait for it and wait until the request finishes. You can just offload that to a different app server, wait for that to finish, and whenever the download's available for the report you just created, you can just send that to the user. So in that sense, it's easy to fix. The problem is you're not always going to know that it's a process issue. So someone's going to have to look at that issue and then figure out that it's not something we can really improve before you can start making changes like this. So it's just going to eat up into development time unnecessarily. Then the customer calling you at 3 a.m., not a fun conversation to have, but yeah, it's going to be bad for the company image. So if this happens a couple of times, people are going to start having questions. I mean, is it really worth it to work with them when every two months we get a big issue like this? It's going to lead to a time crunch because now you know the customer calls you at 3 a.m., you call your developers at 3 a.m., and someone's going to start looking into the issue and start figuring everything out at 3 a.m. Not a great place to be, but even worse, you're going to have to finish this hopefully in a couple of hours, maybe one or two days, but, you know, pretty fast. And you're likely to run into replication issues at this point. So... If the performance issue made it all the way through development, through testing, whatever peer review you're doing, it made it you know, all the way into production, 
chances are you're going to have to make some configuration changes. Maybe you're going to have to create some mock data just to mimic whatever the customer is running into. Because off the get-go, you're probably not going to have the same issue. So it just keeps adding more and more unnecessary you know, time expenditure, just trying to figure out what's going wrong. So in summary, relying on humans is a bad idea. It's fine to you know, go through your code and see if it's slow or not. But if you want to rely on this to make you know, statements about the release or an entire feature, you're not going to have a good time. Instead of that, it makes a lot more sense to start using tooling. There's a bunch of stuff available for progress. And yeah, they should be used a lot more often than they are right now. So the real life example, it's an e-commerce platform. It's essentially split into two pieces, one for the staff, so managers, front desk, all the you know, users at this level. Hasn't really been an issue so far. There's some improvements in the process, but that's beside the point. The other part is one that's used heavily by the customers. So you want to buy something, you go to this website, you search for it, you start buying it, and you, know, you run into performance issues. But yeah, so one key factor here is that load just spikes heavily at some known times. You're going to have some events and essentially every single user of the platform is going to go in and try to buy the same item as everyone else. Now, how the whole thing started. So performance always was an issue. There were some you know, fixes along the way just to deal with some major stuff or whatever improvements some developer found when they were working on something else. But it started really becoming a big thing when load was heavy for some particularly big customers. So they had enormous tables. Uh, the queries weren't particularly optimized. And because of that, things just started slowing down more and more as you know, the application was actually getting some success. After that, we just had the Jira issue to look at performance in general. And then we started an adventure through you know, our entire code base trying to figure out what needs fixing. Now, in terms of tools. So to start off, we used the profiler. Initially, it was just in our developer environments to figure out what was going badly. It wasn't you know, particularly great, but it, it allowed us to focus on some key points that were taking a lot of time for every single request. Again, fairly easy to use, just a couple of lines of code, and you can enable the profiler and yeah. See the results you get. You're going to get timing info, number of calls, just a lot of useful info. Then we also made some changes to our logging, uh, essentially timing how long certain pieces of code took that were you know, commonly used, just to see if we found any outliers there. Now, load testing. So in this case, the issues are showing up under load. Uh, we could start with the developer environment, and we did, and it worked for a bit. But some of the changes, you know, they, they behave completely differently between underload and, you know, whatever couple of process you have on your laptop. So because of that, you're going to want, at least, well, if your issues are happening under load, you're going to want some load testing set up, and you're going to want to be able to run that quickly and get some useful info out of that. Because otherwise, whatever changes you make, you know, it looks like a performance increase. It's going to be a decrease when it actually hits some load. We had to build some quick extras for the profiler. So what we're doing is kind of weird. We're just profiling each request separately, and you end up with you know thousands and thousands of files. So we created just some quick tools to merge those in, and you know, do some basic filtering on, you know, merge these files if it ends up going through this.p. Now, some of the changes we've done as a result of the profiler. So spot fixes and miscellaneous changes. These are the kinds of changes that, you know, someone looks through a file, they see a query that's not particularly great or a temp table that doesn't have the right index for sorting and, you know, various small fixes like that. Logging improvements, again, just a bunch more logging to figure out some performance bottlenecks. And then the big one, so cache mechanism changes. I'll go into a bit, more, a lot more detail after this, 
But essentially, we're storing a bunch of data in a blob in the database and reading all of that back in, into a timetable with every request. And it was just you know, taking a lot of time. Finally, we just removed some unnecessary procedure calls. Some of the stuff we're doing wasn't exactly great. And we just moved to a more lazy loaded approach. Someone asks for some data. If it's there, you know, just return whatever you have. If it's not, fetch it from the database. And yeah, looking into other performance analysis tools, because at this point, the profiler was, you know, you fix everything you can fix. You fix all the outliers. And at the end of the day, all you're going to have is a huge list of procedures. And all of them seem fine. They're probably not. But at that point, it's hard to figure out what's a performance you know, issue and what isn't, because everything is just taking around the same amount of time. So the takeaways here, you're going to want a matching test and production environment. So in this case, it's for load testing. It doesn't make any sense if your load testing setup is completely different. Sure, you're going to have you know, a different number of agents, maybe a different amount of data, but they should match to some extent. You don't want to test things with completely unrealistic scenarios because the data you're going to get out of that is just, you know, essentially useless for any kind of real life uh, use. Then the tests themselves, you want to match the real world usage. You, a load test where someone just refreshes a page over and over again isn't particularly useful. You're going to want to go through some process that the actual users go through to get usable results. Then the test environment itself should stay relatively stable. So you go through load testing, you do all of your performance stuff, you get some results, and you're going to want to store those. So in the future, you can look back and you know, see this is 10% faster than it was you know, two releases ago. To have that work, you're going to need to maintain a stable test environment, because otherwise, any kind of you know, hardware changes, data changes where you move to a different amount of data, those are going to make those kind of invalid at the time. And it's going to be more of a reference kind of thing instead of being able to you know, make a confidence statement that this is better or this is worse. Then again, don't rely on development environment data. It's going to have a way of lying to you in different ways. First, developers are going to have their environment set up in many different ways, so you can't even compare among developers. Then various setups like you know, not caching your R code, or doing some weird things somewhere. That's just going to mess with any kind of result you can get out of this. It's useful when you start looking at things initially to you know, figure out what kind of needs to get changed if what I'm doing right now is slow, or is there any outlier in this procedure I can see. For all of those things, it's useful. But if you want to make a change and push that to production and have a reasonable expectation that it's going to improve things, you're going to need to test it in a, you know, in a suitable environment. Again, store historical performance and profiler data. So the profiler data part kind of bit us for a bit. We were storing the results, so we went through load testing and we'd figure out how much stuff got done, essentially how many items were sold, how many receipts were created, and all that. We stored it and it was fine. The problem was we weren't storing profiler data. So at some point, we decided, OK, but how does this compare to whatever we're profiling two releases ago? And I ended up having to dig through my downloads just to see if I found the zip folder with you know, all those profiler files. It's not that big. It's always useful to have, so make sure you're storing it. It's going to come in handy at some point. Now, for the caching mechanism changes. so. Uh, we were storing some config data, some customized data so in a temp table. That meant that various users would have different permissions, different ways in which the app was behaving, different you know, messages that would pop up on the screen with whatever. You want to include a custom phone number? Here, just change this, and it's all good to go. And to allow for that, we were going through processing all of that, creating the data we needed storing it in the temp table and pushing it on the database and a cache record, essentially. Then whenever requests came through, we'd grab all of that, read it back into the temp table, and you know, that was it. 
and it worked kind of fine. It still works kind of fine if you're looking at it on your development machine. It's not going to be a particularly, you know, egregious waste of resources. But as soon as you hit some load, this changes. So it starts becoming more and more of an issue. In our case, I think at the end of the day, this was something like 30 plus percent of the amount it took to process the request, which is going through this whole process of reading some data from the database. Again, some other small differences, so, well, small, uh, between XML and JSON. So you can read and write from both XML and JSON, but XML is particularly worse. If you're not using, you know, the schema stuff, and you're essentially passing question marks just to get to work, you should probably look into it if you use it heavily because you're just going to get a cheap performance increase. It, on average, it seems to be about two times as bad as reading and writing to a JSON file. It's particularly worse for empty and merge uh, read modes. Not entirely sure why. It's you know just one of those things that kind of happens. But now, instead of doing all of this with blobs from the database, we created some new tables in the database. They mimic the same schema as those same tables we had previously with you know an extra bit at the top just to tell it this is the cache record we're looking at. And just these changes, you know, that 30% drop down to, I don't know, five-ish, probably less depending on how things went. But yeah, just a huge increase because we were doing things badly. This is another, another issue people have with performance. So people don't necessarily measure, uh, measure things. They think, okay, this takes a long time. We're going to cache it. If you don't measure the impact of that change, you, you can never tell if it's going to be an increase or a decrease when it actually makes it to production. So yeah, in this case, 30% just from moving to, you know, not caching stuff, essentially. A similar thing for buffer copy and assign. Buffer copy is just faster. Depending on the number of records in your, you know, timetables or data sets, you're going to see a performance improvement from 6% to 15%. So, yeah, if you've got them tables with weird names, just change those to match the database schema and good to go. Now for the ongoing investigation. So we did whatever changes were obvious from the profiler. Things are better now, but they're not great. So we start looking at extra files and some index data. Uh, the index data here is essentially the VST underscore file and underscore index tables, just so we could figure out what indexes we had on database on various tables and how they were getting used. So the extra files, you're just gonna contain a bunch of useful information. In this case, we're only gonna look at queries, but the idea is you compile with XREF and it's gonna tell you what indexes are getting used, what fields are accessed in the query, that way you're going to have a better idea of what changes you can make to that. So this is a screenshot of a kind of proof of concept app. We were essentially just, you know, compile everything with XREF, parse all of those files, grab whatever info we were interested in, and build something like that. So you've got the query text, the fields it was actually indexing on, and then whether or not the query was whole access, sort access, what other fields were being used in the query and whether or not there was an index available that used those fields. So in our case, we're doing a bad thing where our indexes are kind of field-based. You're not really going to see a lot of indexes that go over, you know, five fields that are commonly used. It's, you know, not good, but <laughs> the idea is with small changes like this, where you automatically go over your entire code base, essentially, you're easily going to find issues where just by changing the order of some parameters, in this case, I think it's, uh, yeah, not the last line, the one just above it. It's checking not something archived. That's not going to pick up an index. So if you just get rid of the not and change it to equals false, you know, better indexing. Do something like this where it goes through the entire project and you're going to keep adding more and more performance improvements. This is, this is the part of the process that's kind of slow and you're not really going to see any kind of immediate results unless you have some really good metrics around your application because whatever changes you do 
aren't going to you know, affect those load tests. They're not something people are going to see regularly. But it still improves things. And you know, changes like this one where you know, 3% here, 3% there, eventually it's going to make everything just a lot faster. And yeah, you've got a line that tells you about performance improvements from the previous slides. That's just the copy and was left by mistake. Uh, on a similar note, so this is just a proof of concept tool we built. Uh, there was a talk earlier today about custom sonar lint rules. And yeah, I'm not entirely sure, but it's it should be doable. So you can implement something like this with you know either custom rules or by feeding it whatever indexes you have. So that way, whenever you type a query and you do it badly, it's going to yell at you that, you know, this is wrong. You should probably do something like this. So if people are interested, definitely look into that. I think uh, that presentation is going to have, you know, the actual presentation and some custom rules example up on some GitHub repo. Now, in terms of the changes with it. So we moved from find statements to for statements. Again, this is more of an issue with the way we defined our indexes, where we had, you know, one index per field, essentially. And the find wasn't really going to pick up multiple indexes, so we just moved to four statements. That helped a bunch. We made some index changes for some particularly hot tables. So in our case, we have a single table that's used for context. So a request comes in, you do whatever, you want to store some things on the context for that particular session, you do that. And it just kept growing and growing. And at some point with every single request, you had to you know, read from database, grab 100-ish records, put those into the table, go to the request, create whatever needs to be created, delete whatever needs to be deleted, that's fine. And at the end, to make things uh, quicker, <laughs> We were, you know, clearing everything for that session and then grabbing the temp table and pulling that back up into the database. So obviously that was a huge waste of resources. We made some index changes on tables like that. Well, not just that one, but some others. The idea was, you know, index changes. Now, instead of uh, having a single index per field, there's a couple of tables that are heavily used that have proper indexes defined. Another bunch of small issues. So again, these are various fixes to various queries, various stem tables, create a new index for sorting, change the field order around a bit, and things just keep adding up and up. Now, for some takeaways, check your queries. And this is particularly troublesome because you can't really rely on people again. Not everyone's gonna have, you know, full knowledge of all your database schema in the back of your head to look at queries and tell you if things are right or wrong. So you definitely need tooling if you expect, you know, any kind of reasonable accuracy here. Don't trust in just your eyes. Peer review looks fine to me. That At the end of, a you know, 10,000 lines of changes, everything looks good at that point. And finally, many small changes add up. You're not going to see immediate results. But do this for a couple of releases and people are going to start telling you that, you know, things look faster and faster and better. So for some of the final investigation we did at that point and some of the tools we used. Now, DB analysis. So in this case, it was just running uh, ProUtil DB analysis and there's a space missing there. We essentially wanted to see how many records we were storing and we found a bunch of tables where we were storing uh, historical data. In our case, we had a fee structure that could change over time. And at some point of the process, we decided to keep a copy with that, of that as every item got sold. So obviously, as the fee structure itself was fairly complicated, it just kept adding up and up and growing and growing, and it started to become an issue. A similar thing was happening when people bought something, got the, the card, but didn't finalize their sale. So essentially got canceled. We were storing that as well, and we really shouldn't have. Then, uh, table stats and index stats. These are just VST tables you have in progress, and they're going to give you a bunch of information about the number of, you know, crowd operations on tables, on indexes, the amount of reads the table goes through to, to the actual disk instead of the database cache. All you need to enable this and configure it is just those, you know, four parameters that define the number of tables that are actually going to have stats created for. 
it's easy to do, and the only thing you have to do at the end of the day is look through those records and see what outliers you can find. And again, uh, process changes. Similar to the stuff we were talking about before with, you know, report for 10 years. Just a bunch of stuff that was part of the sale process where you started and all the way at the end you got your receipt. We decided to make some changes there and offload some bits and pieces of it where it made sense to a different app server so people wouldn't have to wait as long. So people don't really care if they get the receipt immediately or if they have to wait two minutes and they get in their email. It's a fairly small change, but yeah, when you have a couple thousand people heading the application at the same time, it's, it's a big improvement. Now, the actual changes. So, uh, those table stats and those index stats, we saw that the context table we were mentioning previously was just seeing way too much use because we were doing things the quick way and just deleting everything and rewriting to the database. Uh, in here, we decided to go for that caching approach that didn't work when we were, you know, dealing with config data. In this case, we expected a pretty big improvement that still was kind of big. At the end of the day, we got 10%. But yeah, caching, depending on how you do it, it might work for one particular situation. It might not work for another. In our case, yeah, now instead of having 100 database records, you just have maybe two or three of them and they store a temp table in a blob, and that just works. Now, index and schema changes. So we have the number of records, we have various stats on indexes, we know what things are used, what things really aren't, and we made some schema changes based on that to just help with the overall performance. Then we added some timeouts to the UI side. So we had an autocomplete field and it worked. The problem was it was auto-completing unnecessarily. So someone types, you know, the first uh, digit of a phone number, goes through the database, reads a couple of million <laughs> records, and tries to return all of those to, uh, to the UI. It, someone types the next digit. And at the end of the day, you ended up with, you know, at least five-ish requests for every single time someone typed a phone number that just got sent out and then effectively ignored. And in our case, just a quick UI change to add some sort of timeout. So if you're typing, it doesn't send requests, it just sends it whenever you're finished, and it doesn't send it if you know you have a single digit. I think so that phone record, let's say phone was seeing a couple million, and it was only really getting access from the management app, the one that wasn't seeing a lot of load. And yeah, just quick change. Cut that down to you know reasonable numbers, couple you know thousand lookups. Then we added multi-threading, and you can see it's between codes because it's not really multi-threading. So, uh, as part of the application, you can make reservations for really long periods of time across different you know items, and all of that ended up being split up into chunks wherever applicable. So now instead of okay, go buy these couple of thousands of things and go through the entire process of checking various conditions for every single user and create a couple thousand items and all of that. Now it's just split up into manageable chunks. So it sends, you know, do five seconds worth of work and then come back to the UI. When someone needs to enter some, you know, user input, you do that. It goes back to processing. And it just feels a lot faster to the user and a lot more manageable because you don't have to wait for 20 minutes just to see if something actually finishes or not. And if you're somewhere in the cloud, you probably have some more reasonable request timeouts. So, you know, something like five minutes instead of, you know, being able to set it to 30 minutes and then forget about it because it just works with your application. Okay, this is going quicker than I thought. Now we're off to other findings. So these are the things that were kind of interested, uh, kind of interesting, but not really performance issues. So, uh, web speed and cookies. We're using web speed, a request comes in, we load a bunch of data from whatever the user sends us. And in this case, it was cookies. Whatever the user sent, we kind of loaded them first, which ended up badly uh, for developers, especially depending on how you reload your browser and how many weird things you were doing at the time. 
you could end up with a lot of cookies with a bunch of data that was essentially telling you where you were on the UI side. So instead of having to manually navigate there after you reopen a screen or something, it would just automatically put you there. That was using cookies because it was done before, you know, session storage and all of that. And those were coming in with every single request. At the end of the day, we found a weird thing where if you maliciously, uh, maliciously crafted a cookie, so essentially just keep adding a bunch of garbage data in it, just A equals one, B equals one, keep going until it complains about the length of the cookie. You could essentially just DDoS an agent for a couple of minutes, just reading all of that cookie data. So but again, simple fix. We just no longer do that. We look at the one thing we're interested in from a cookie, the session ID, and everything else, you know, we just ignore. Now, profiler and pause statements. So this might not be the case in OE12 anymore, hopefully not in 12.8, but the profiler doesn't really care about pause statements. So it runs through code, it hits a pause statement, effectively ignores it and moves on. That way, if you're using pause statements to you know, retry locking a record or retry sending requests to some different API, those things weren't getting caught by the profiler. So you could have just chunks of time missing. And again, the easiest way to deal with that, we just added some logging around it. Instead of causing, uh, calling pause, you just call a different function. And you, know, you can look through the logs afterwards just to see if you're doing a bunch of pausing. In our case, we weren't, but you know, it's, it's a nice thing to know about. Then there's waiting for locks. So again, this is something people know about but you shouldn't be really doing locking in a bad way. So share locks are kind of bad. If you're doing a for each with exclusive lock, it's also kind of bad. In our case, after we uh, did that multi-threading change, you ended up with different requests going through the same data at the same time uh, in a for each exclusive lock. And you know, after 10 seconds, you get back an error message. So again, we went through some code, figured out what we were doing wrong, change that, and now instead of just waiting for 10 seconds and erroring out, it actually works. The, the one nice thing about this is if you're waiting for a log, the profiler is gonna figure out the amount of time it took, so it's not like a pause statement where it's just lost. This, this actually gives you the right amount of time. Finally, there's user input. So our users are kind of allergic to any kind of filtering. If you give them a blank search page, you're going to click search and see what shows up on the screen first. In our case, we were loading every single item and we had to do some extra checking in the process. So it was kind of bad. We went through everything, checked everything and loaded the IDs in a temp table. And we had that, you know, stored for this particular search. This is the result set. Again, because there was no actual filtering, it took a while. Immediately after they did this search, the user would actually filter by something, so they'd get the things they were interested in. But yeah, some quick UI changes to make sure they actually have to enter something that we can filter by, and some checks on the back end to you know, just make sure we don't end up running requests through the entire database tables just for a couple of records. Then, profile retracing. Uh, on the same profiler system handle, you can enable tracing. You can do it based on a filter, so it only does it for you know this particular function or this particular file. But the idea is, instead of just having averages, you're gonna have execution by execution info on what was happening. That way, if a particular line is you know fine most of the time, there's no issues, but every so often it just has to wait for five seconds because it's complete, uh, competing for some lock you're gonna be able to figure it out from tracing data. Again, this is an issue with the tooling we have right now, but at least in 11.7, there's no easy way of seeing what's happening with tracing. So you're gonna to have to manually parse the profiler output files to find the outliers. But yeah, hopefully we can see some big improvements here. I know there's a talk sometime later, I think, about uh, a profiler extension for VS Code. So looking forward to that and what's happening with it. Then dynamic queries and reflection. So we're using dynamic queries and it works fine. We use it for reporting, but whenever you use these, you kind of have to assume that performance is gonna be worse than having it done statically. 
it's, you know, don't do it unnecessarily. That's the key point here. The other thing, reflection, we started moving to OOP some time ago and we were using reflection to load data from the database into some properties on a class and, you know, reflection to figure out the properties we actually had. This is just testing on the dev side, but I think it was a 10x decrease in performance moving from, you know, a assigned property equals value to doing the assign based on reflection. So if you're using this heavily, just give it a quick check to make sure nothing's really wrong there. Uh, yeah, let me think if I missed anything else. Nope, make sure you use no weight on your find firsts and all of that. But yeah, that's about it. Now, if anyone has some questions. I mean, this, th at this point, this means I've done really well or really badly. <laughs> Yeah, my next presentation, so this, this is what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, there's no slide for this, but tomorrow I've got a talk early in the morning, I think, in the, in the room just, you know, to the left about logging and some log analytics, essentially quick setup to see how things, how easily things can get, you know, done. And yeah, if there's no question then, thank you for coming. Uh, if anyone wants to ask me about anything, I'll probably be around the booth, so feel free, uh, feel free to drop by and, you know, at least pick up a pen with the wafer name on it or something. But yeah, that's it for me, and thank you again for being here.